I cannot tell you how delighted I am to welcome you here this morning and to thank you uh, for getting up early to be here. My friend uh, Reed Kramer from uh, New America Foundation, who did so much work to make this event happen, told me he doesn't do uh, events before nine. Um, <laughs> um, so I appreciate the sacrifices you made. My name is Bob Friedman. I'm chair of the Corporation for Enterprise Development, CFED, one of the six national partners, along with New America Foundation, the Center for Social Development, uh, uh, the Aspen Institute Initiative for Financial Security, Kansas University School of Social Welfare, and RTI International, who collaborated uh, to produce the Saving for Education Entrepreneurship Down Payment uh, Policy Research and Practice Initiative, which we call SEED for short. Uh, we really believe that children's savings accounts, children's development accounts, are the cornerstone of the save and invest economy. We believe that you have to start as early as birth to amass the savings necessary to uh, navigate uh, through life's challenges and opportunities. We didn't just believe that, we wanted to test it. And so in the 10-year SEED initiative, rigorously evaluated uh, with multiple methods, we tried to find out how children's development accounts might work and how they work best, uh, and rigorously test um, how they would work as a prelude uh, to policy. And today's uh, briefing, we want to take you through the lessons of the first part of the SEED initiative. It is a 10-year-plus initiative, uh, and we're a little more than halfway through. Uh, and then we want to uh, focus in the latter half on the policy progeny of the SEED initiative, the attempts to really create an opportunity uh, for all kids in this country and indeed all families to pursue this. The SEED initiative follows on the American Dream demonstration, which was a partnership of a lot of the same folks uh, that you will see present today. In that initiative, we tested whether low-income people would save. And what we found was that given the opportunity, low income, even very poor families would save, start businesses, buy and maintain homes, uh, and uh, pursue higher education. We found that folks, the poorest folks uh, in the demonstration, uh, folks, um, making less than half the poverty line, actually participated, uh, saved at about the same level and at two to three times the rate of uh, folks at twice the poverty line. And when we asked them, why do you do this? <laughs> How can you do this? They said to us in one way or another, this is the price of security and this is the price. We also found that this was more than just a matter of money and finance. That as Professor Michael Sheradden, who you will hear from soon, um, said, uh, income may feed people's stomachs, but assets change their heads. And we derived from that ample uh, proof that with a little bit of money and some financial education, people would seize control of their futures. There are seats up here, I invite all of you to move up and fill in. Uh, they would see a future better than the present. They would plan for that future. They would prepare for it uh, when only they believe. And after that, we began to think, well, if 
if assets and saving and financial education can make this big a difference for adults, what might it do if you started at uh, as early as birth, but certainly with kids? Uh, and we began with that simple notion of what difference would it make if every child in this country uh, and even the world, uh, uh, Professor Bhagwan Chowdhury is here moving this international, uh, had a nest egg if they wanted uh, to go to college, buy a home, start a business. And we determined uh, to find out. That launched the SEED initiative, which was a multi-million dollar, more than 10 year initiative. It was extremely complex. By the end of SEED, we had more than 50 partners. Uh, you know, if you're married, you know something about partnerships. I think of these kind of partnerships as time-limited marriages. Um, and you can imagine the complexity of 50 partners, six national partners, 12 community partners, uh, a, uh, a multiple state partners, 12 national funders, financial institution partners uh, for every one of those community partners. Uh, but I would have to say uh, that the whole is way more, I think, than the sum of the parts. SEED continues, uh, guided by the Center for Social Development and Michael Sheradden. There is underway in Oklahoma at this time, uh, SEED for Oklahoma Kids, or SEED OK, which is testing a universal system uh, with random assignment experimental design in the state of Oklahoma. The research on that will extend for years, at least five more years, and the foundation is being laid for longer term. This is with uh, infants in their first year. What has been completed in SEED and what we will mostly report on today are the 12 community partner uh, demonstrations. Uh, in 11 of those, uh, very diverse uh, community programs ranging from Cherokee Nation in rural uh, Oklahoma to Harlem Children's Zone and People for People in uh, Philadelphia, tested 75 accounts each, provided an average of $2,000 in financial incentives, a seed, initial deposit, matching sa savings, and in some cases, benchmark deposits for, for example, completion of financial education. Uh, we experimented with, or excuse me, we had part among the more than 1,100 participants were children at all ages, preschool, elementary, middle school, high school age. We wanted to mimic a 20-year life cycle uh, in five years, and we were able to do that. We had an extensive research team uh, of three major institutions uh, using six different research methodologies, and they've already produced dozens of studies, um, and the more will come out. Michael Sheradden is the father of this field. In his seminal book, Assets in the Poor, in 1991, he talked about savings accounts, match savings accounts for everybody starting as early as birth. Um, if we had only started where uh, he started, we might have done this uh, 10 years ago or 20, uh, but we're learning slowly. Uh, Michael was named one of the 100 most influential people in the world by Time Magazine earlier this year. Uh, I consider him a kind of Johnny Asset Seed, uh, spread, <laughs> <laughs> spreading, spreading asset policy and practice globally. Uh, he is a genuine renaissance leader. He understands policy, he understands program design, he understands advocacy, although he will deny all of that. Uh, for the SEED initiative, he wore the hat of researcher. Uh, actually, sometimes I thought he was too tough <laughs> on us and too objective, uh, but we are very grateful for his leadership uh, and, and his guidance all along. 
Michael will present the key lessons of SEED at this point. Michael. It's, uh, it's wonderful to be here. Um, on, the, on the Johnny Appleseed comment, he actually one of our one of my folk heroes. So it, it's not well known, but my son's middle name is Chapman, and it's after John Chapman, which is Johnny Appleseed. So um, it's a you know you know Bob Bob gives me lots of credit here, but it's really Bob who who does this. Bob uh, has an extraordinary ability to, to to take an idea and imagine imagine a demonstration like this. It's a huge thing. I mean, it's a, a huge entrepreneurial uh, endeavor uh, to even think that you can do a project as enormous as SEED and to pull all of the pieces together, the funding and the partners, to make that happen. So Bob, Bob makes, uh, and, and CFED, uh, uh, the whole organization, makes these kinds of efforts real in the world. Um, and, and then we have examples, and we have people, and we have data and we're able to say something worthwhile. So uh, all the credit belongs to Bob and CFED. So. Um, I, have, I have just a few minutes. I'm supposed to talk about all the lessons of SEED, which is, which is pretty impossible. Uh, Bob, Bob did talk about all of the partners, and, we, and I, I, there are a lot of individual people who ought to be named, but we don't have time to do that. As Bob said, there were I, did you say 50 organizations? So you can imagine, we're talking about hundreds, probably thousands of people involved in this initiative in, in various ways. So it's, it's impossible to name everyone, but there's some, uh, some people in the room who, are, who, are, uh, who have uh, carried, carried the ball here in a, in a huge way. Uh, some of them will speak today and some of them will not. But I, I, won't, I won't name everyone, but uh, all of these people are, have, have, made, um, have made this possible. Um, Bob, as Bob said, the seed was very complex and implemented in, in multiple ways. Um, I'm going to talk about the, the findings from seed. This is, these are primarily research findings, but some of them are kind of practice experience findings, most, mostly research, however. And I would like, to, I would, in, in terms of research, I would like to acknowledge um, the University of Kansas uh, research partner, and, and especially Deb Adams and Ed Scanlon. Uh, we work with RTI International uh, survey firm, uh, really do excellent work, and Ellen Marks was leading that team from, from RTI International. And um, oh, working, working with the University of Kansas team was uh, uh, Trina Williams from the University of Michigan. And we're also working with the University of Oklahoma on the in-depth interviews for Seed OK. So it's a quite large, diverse uh, research team. Uh, and, on, and in my shop, uh, a, a lot of people have been involved in, the, in uh, seed research, but I'd like especially like to acknowledge Margaret Clancy, who's here, who's really uh, leading this and managing, uh, especially managing seed okay in our shop. Uh, huge, uh, huge contributions. So um, again, we're, we're th those people and a, really a small army of graduate students have been trained in SEED. So it's actually another contribution of SEED is training all of these graduate students who are out doing pretty amazing work uh, of their own uh, following up with, with, this, uh, with this work. So what are the lessons? Um, I'll talk about a few of them. Uh, you do have a copy of a report, Lessons from SEED, so you'll have time to read about that in more detail. Even the lessons from seed document that you have is a pretty, a pretty tight distillation of, of a lot of work. So uh, we, do, we do cite the research reports, and in the back is a, a, a bibliography. These are available online, uh, almost all of them. And if you, if you can find something, let us know. We'll, we'll be glad to follow up with you. So I'll talk about a, a few of the lessons from seed, some of the things that we've learned. Um, one is that this is, a, this is research done by a, a marketing firm, actually, that, you know, this is a pretty popular idea in America. If you ask people, is it a good idea to give kids an account, they will, they, a lot of them will say yes, even if it's a good idea to put some money in that account to get them started. So this idea, and, and it happens across the population, it's not, it's not a Republican or a Democratic idea. As you'll hear later today also, in Washington, this is not a Republican or a Democratic idea, very bipartisan. So this is an idea that seems to tap into something deeper than partisan politics. Um, 
people feel very right about the idea of giving uh, kids an account to start them out in life. There's something that feels very American about the idea. It seems to tap into fairness and opportunity, maybe some deep values, which we're sort of losing track of, of, of thrift and savings as, a, as a, 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 what you have to do if you want to get ahead in the world, uh, and, and believing in, in, in investing in the next generation, which has always been a, <clears throat> been a very uh, a strong idea for all parents in the world and, and, and maybe also for, for most nations. But we, we think about it as an American idea, although as Bhagwan uh, knows, this is not just an American idea. This is an idea that uh, can appeal to, to lots of people in, in lots of different cultures. So, so it's popular. There's a, this, is, this, is a, this is not a small thing. Uh, the, the fact that this idea has such appeal gives us a lot of reason to be very hopeful about what we can do if the data, and I'm putting my research hat on, if the data pan out and support the, support the notion. So I'll look a little bit at the data. Um, one of the things that we have found in, in uh, savings and promoting savings for low-income populations and, and for promoting a, an idea of a universal account is that, um, and, and this is consistent with a lot of research in behavioral economics, is that people will not, even if, the, even if it's something is good for them and even if it's easy and even if there's a financial incentives, a lot of people will not do it. Um, this, is not a, this is not a comment about any particular group of people, poor people or others, basically as human beings we're not very good financial managers. Um, pretty much true for all of us. Uh, there's a few exceptions, but most of us don't do that well. So what works financially for people is that things are automatic. Uh, this is working for a lot of you in the room. You have some kind of retirement account at work. You go in, you sign some paper, after that, automatic. Uh, they, we have found, or, or, or researchers have found with 401k plans that even signing the paper uh, is, can be made automatic, and that increases participation in 401k plans a huge amount. So, so the lesson here from SEED is that if people have to sign up for it, you're probably not going to get full participation. So the idea is automatic enrollment, maybe with an opt-out. And for evidence from SEED, um, we did in SEED OK, the, it's an experiment in Oklahoma, as Bob mentioned, we did, um, we did, first we had to ask people if they wanted to be in the study and get their signature for approval to be in the study. Then we randomly assigned a treatment and control group. With the treatment group, we automatically opened an account. So we opened an account for 1,361 people and only one turned it down. Uh, now this is a lot better participation rate than, than we get when we say to people, will you sign up for your kid to have an account? Uh, if you can get 1,360 out of 1,361, you're batting pretty well. Um, so, so the idea is, and, we, and this is consistent with, with a lot of other research, you know, make things automatic, make things easy for people. People, people will appreciate it. It's not, it's not like taking away freedoms. You, you can allow them to opt out. You know, you could say, you know, you, can, you don't have to have it. So it's not like forcing people to do something. But what you do is make it easier for them to do it. So that's one lesson from SEED consistent with, with others. Um, we also know that um, savings difficult. The seed population uh, from the community partners was uh, about half below the poverty line. About 40% were on food stamps. 10% uh, were, were receiving TANF, so a pretty low income population. Uh, but still, this group saved on average $30 a quarter. Doesn't sound like a lot of money, but uh, during the period that SEED was operating, the savings rate in America was about zero. So actually these families were probably doing better than the average household uh, in the country. So they were saving. Uh, it was not easy, but uh, many of them uh, were able to save something. Um, and that's an important lesson. And again, we, we know that, uh, that the features of the accounts mattered. So other research showed that not only did automatic account opening uh, matter, but also automatic depositing, direct deposit was more effective. We also know that um, uh, some kind of an initial deposit is probably a good idea if you want to get these accounts started and get people to participate in them <clears throat> and accumulate assets over the long term. And we also found, and this is this finding very strong and also very consistent with research on individual development accounts, people seem to respond very well to a, a match, a, an amount of money that can be matched. So if you say to people, we will match your savings up to $25 a month, um, 
but if you raise that to $50 a month, people will try to go for the 50. So people will turn, will turn this match amount into a target, a savings target. So this, this appears to be a very strong finding from, from the IDA research and from seed research, and, and I think we should pay a lot more attention to it. Um, Bob said that maybe savings enable uh, people to envision a future, uh, and I think that's pretty strong pretty strong theory. It seems reasonable. Most of us kind of believe that. Um, but we, indeed, we, we, um, we have some evidence that that might, I'm speaking as a researcher here, we have some evidence that that might be true or people say that it might be true for them. Uh, we don't have real concrete evidence from seed. We have done at CSD in another body of work called the College Savings Initiative, we have done some other recent studies in 2009-2010 uh, that show that if there are savings in a household that, 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 the, that at, one, at point, time point one, at a, at a later time point, the, both children and families' expectations of education will have increased. Uh, so we do have that evidence. We have evidence that if there are savings in a household um, in the name of a young person, that, that young people are hugely more likely to attend college. Uh, we have evidence that both financial uh, assets in a household and non-financial assets are positively associated with college completion, even controlling for income. And in fact, I'm going to talk statistically here a little bit, um, if we control for income, uh, if we put income and, and, and assets in the same regression, it's the assets that predict college completion and not the income. Income becomes non-significant. This is a really important finding. Um, we typically think that high-income households, uh, will, their, their kids will be more likely to uh, succeed in education, but we find this repeatedly in different, in different large-scale longitudinal data sets. It's not the income that's predicting, it's the asset holdings in the family. So uh, assets will matter for college education completion more, more than income. Or I can say it statistically, income doesn't matter. Um, so this is a really important finding, again, uh, consistent with the results that we're finding in SEED. I think we have more work to do on this. We, we, we are running the experiment in SEED OK. We will know after about 18 more years if these kids are <laughs> attending college. So, so some young scholar will be standing here giving, you, giving the results to some group of people a, a couple decades from now. Uh, and I expect that these accounts will significantly affect college completion for, for this group of babies. Um, we will see. Um, I, I, I'm probably going to go over time. Bob, will you give me the, the sign if I start to run over? Um, we don't know much about financial education. Uh, we, we think it matters. People say that it matters. But, you know, to be honest, this is a field that requires a lot more work. Um, we have some evidence in IDAs and in SEED that financial education is probably uh, makes a difference, but we also know that financial education is really hard to deliver. It's expensive. So this is not, a, this is not a, an area where we have firm conclusions, and uh, a lot more work needs to be done with that. There's a lot of, there's a lot of discussion now broadly in the country about uh, financial education. We prefer to think in terms of financial capability, a broader idea that includes having access to savings or, or financial services. But regardless, we really don't have good data sets or good data uh, on, on financial education. And whether it's a benefit cost issue, whether the amounts of money that are required to invest in it really have a payoff. So we have more work to do there. Um, we think, we think at, uh, at Center for Social Development that savings plan structures have a lot of potential. Um, we, a lot of a, uh, the, seed, the seed projects uh, that had large studies were working with uh, 529 plans, college savings plans. Um, we were also doing other research on college savings plans. Four of the five state policy initiatives in seed were working with college savings plans. And we think, we think college savings plans as a structure have a lot of potential because they're already there. Um, they have a centralized record keeping system. They can reach out to a population. Um, they can keep costs very low. Uh, for asset accumulation, costs for savings over the long term really matter. And 529 plans, many of them now have cost structures that are down around uh, a half a percent uh, a year. Some, some fi state 529 plans have, have options that are down to one-tenth of one percent a year, 10 basis points. So these are, these are low-cost plans, which will really matter over time. We also know that people get confused by having too many choices. So again, a lot of behavioral economics research. So 
So we're pretty interested in plan structures. We think that the, the lessons from seed uh, support that. Uh, this is not a universal view in the field. Other people think that 529 plans are uh, maybe too remote. There's not a bank in your neighborhood to go to. Uh, there are some state 529 plans that are not very, are not very good. Uh, some are better than others. So, uh, so this is an area where there's lots of room for, for discussion and debate. But, but at least at CSD, we remain quite interested in 529 plans. And as part of that, uh, we know that, that many states are trying to change 529 so that they can become something that doesn't just serve the top half of the income distribution, but reaches out. So more than 10 states now have some kind of matching for low and moderate income households. Some states have automatic features. Uh, states are doing a bunch of things to try to make 529s more, uh, more, more universal and inclusive. Um, another part of, of C that, that, that Bob didn't mention, and is not, not research, but actually a very rich part of seed was their seed policy council. I'm going to mention this because we, we, a bunch of us got around the table, worked, actually worked very hard at this and, and sort of saw, tried to discover what, what dimensions of this issue really matter, what do we think about them, and again, you know, lots of different viewpoints and we really worked back and forth to try to work these out. And we were able to arrive at some principles, which I think are quite important. So I'm going to state them here. Uh, the, the Seed Policy Council arrived at the view that if there's going to be a, a child development account or child savings account, that it should be universal, that everyone should be included. Uh, it should be lifelong. And I think this is a really important uh, point, that it, it's, not a, it's not an account that, that begins at birth and ends at age 18, but it's an account that might carry through life. Uh, this relates to a larger point about, about structures of saving and, and saving as a, as a financial matter and I think also as a social policy matter and how we want to think about that. And some kind of universal lifelong account probably makes a lot of sense. The Seed Policy Council said that savings ought to also be progressive. That is, if there's going to be public benefits that lower income people should get larger benefits. Uh, as I've often said, I would be happy with a, with a, with a, pu a public policy uh, uh, value that said that savings subsidies at least ought to be fair. Uh, and by fair, I mean every household, every baby gets the same kind of, uh, the same amount of subsidy. Right now, as you know, asset subsidies go overwhelmingly to the top half of the population. Enormously regressive policy structure with several hundred billion dollars a year passed out to people like me and, uh, and other people with, with better jobs uh, for, for their retirement accounts and their home equity uh, and really nothing going to the bottom. This is a really egregious uh, set of public policies that, that ought to be changed. So we can, we can talk about progressive, but if you don't want to sound too lefty, just talk about fair, you know? If we're, gonna, if we're gonna pass out the money, just the same amount for everybody. No one can object to this principle. Okay, um, I'll, I'll close with just a, a, few, a few kind of larger thoughts. I do think, as I said in the beginning, I think this idea, what's the, um, this is about the meaning of, of, uh, of seed and, and the meaning of, of child development accounts or child savings accounts. I do think that this is a kind of um, returning to roots, a kind of returning to thrift and investment that has a lot of appeal right now, given that we've just gone through this uh, uh, phenomenal financial credit and uh, uh, financial and credit crisis and although I, I guess the recession is over we, we learned uh, yesterday uh, we're going to be in this mess for quite a, a while to come there will be a reevaluation of the role of savings uh, um, in, in, in households so that's happening as part of that more attention to repairing and restoring balance sheets of households over time and this idea can fit into that broader picture very, very uh, well. As I said, the, the, this idea of a, of a seed account or a child savings account also it fits into the idea of creating a better future for, for the next generation. I think also that it's, um, as I thought really for a long time, that this can be a core feature of, uh, I, I'm, I'm I'm pretty sure that most countries now are in the process of hammering out a new set of social policies and a new social contract, one that fits a, a post-industrial society. And um, 
it's hard to know where that's going to go, but it's pretty clear that some kind of, of individual account or asset building account is going to be part of that. This is a, a really an almost hidden revolution happening in, in social policy with all these accounts being created for all kinds of things. And, and, and by social policy, I don't mean just government accounts. I mean also 401ks and the like that have really taken over uh, retirement benefits uh, attached to employers. Defined benefit retirement plans are, are you know, going out of business in the, in the uh, private sector. So there's this huge changes happening. The big issues, there are big risks involved in this. The big issues, will everyone be included? Uh, will everyone get fair treatment? And I think that child development accounts, seed accounts are a step in that direction and make a very clear statement that this is the way we ought to go. Thank you very much. We're going to have questions and answers at the end, but if there's one burning question for Michael. Okay. Thank you very much. <clears throat> there's an enormous amount that Michael covered. It is summarized in here, and I really commend this uh, to your reading afterwards. So Michael, as he does, gave you the global view. I think it's really necessary to look at seed from a very particular view. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> and I'm honored to introduce to you Joshua Flores, one of the 1,171 participants in uh, seed. Joshua, where are you? Ah, here you are. Uh, now, I won't tell you that every uh, participant in seed was as stellar as this young man. Um, but I will also tell you he's not atypical either of all of them, and I can't think of a better spokesperson. Joshua. Good morning. My name is Joshua Flores, and I'm 15 years old, and is currently attending Philadelphia Mennonite High School in North Philadelphia. While attending Pew for People Charter School, I had the opportunity in participating in the SEED program. I did not think I'd be able to save like I have without this wonderful SEED program and the match money. When I get out of high school, I will want to use my SEED money to fulfill my dreams and get closer in my educational future. To this day, I have saved over $4,500 that my family has invested in my future. I didn't really think about saving money until I heard about the SEED program. Every time I de deposit money into my SEED account, I realized that I am investing in my future and my educational career. During my participation in the program, my family and I attended various workshops where we learned how to save money and invest in our future. This summer, this summer I worked a part-time job and was able to make a deposit in my 529 plan that really meant a lot to me. Just like if plants need water to grow, I need family and friends to help me learn how to save money to invest in my future. I thank God for the C program and its founders for helping me a part of the program. I hope that one day other youth will have the opportunity that I have to get a seed account for a better future in their lives. Thank you. Stay up here a second. Joshua, can I ask you a couple of questions? Uh, first, how did you save? Well, I didn't really know about the C program f until about fifth grade, and I've been in the C pro program for about seven years now, and I really wasn't interested. Then, then my dad told me about college, and he told me that you can do whatever you want with your money to start a business, and I really looked into it, and. I really wanted to study it. So my sister encouraged me to try it because she has sickle cell disease and she was always in the hospital a lot. And she went to college to study criminal justice, so I decided that I wanted to do the same and follow after her and be the second person in my family to probably graduate from college. So that's what encouraged me. And can I ask you, how much uh, did you have in your account at the end of SEED? The end of seed, I had 2,500. 
and that's after, before the match money, and now I have 4,500. I just want to point out one of the things we haven't been able to study is savings behavior after uh, the seed program, and I think this is a imp pretty important anecdotal <laughs> finding uh, that uh, we see with a lot of others in a lot of the successful individual development account programs, up to 83% of savers continue to save even after the match. But there is another ingredient here. Reverend Flores, the dad, <laughs> you come up here. <laughs> Reverend Flores wears two hats <laughs> as a dad. <laughs> Uh, the primary one, but he also was working at People for People at the time and worked uh, rolling over the accounts that started in a credit union over to 529 plans. Um, so I, I guess I want to ask you two questions. <laughs> How was that process of rolling over accounts and could you have used one basic account structure? And then the second uh, and more important, how as a dad and as a family, and did seed affect you? Let me just um, first say that um, doing my work at the People for People as a business manager, and as we were thinking about rolling over the seed money to the 529 plan, there was a lot of paperwork involved in that process. And I sort of wear a couple hats as a parent, and then as 5% uh, of my time was committed to working with the seed program. And so, um, getting parents to come and fill out those paperwork were very uh, interested in, and many of them did not want to fill out those paperwork. So what I would do, I would go door to door. I would go to the homes of those parents and um, uh, encourage them of the importance of filling out this paperwork to, in, to transfer that money to the 529 plan. And we had good success rate with that, um, uh, helping them to be relaxed about the information that was collected on those paperwork. Uh, was really a good thing for us to do. So that was really helpful for those parents. Uh, many of them transferred their funds to the 529 plan. One of the things I also like for the 529 plan is that just recently, as a matter of fact, last week I received a call from the 529 plan saying that there's some interest rate that's going to go up by the end of the month. We'd like to see you make a good deposit into that account. And that was very encouraging. And we were able to make a deposit into that account as a result of them following up on encouraging the participation in the 529 um, plan. The other thing that I think was um, important for the SEED program uh, for us is um, uh, many of our parents and many of our um, families are not really uh, up to savings. And the educational pieces of SEED was very instrumental in motivating many people who participated in the program. Uh, the, we have PNC Bank, we have very bankers that came in uh, to just help parents to be relaxed and understand the importance of saving uh, in the SEED program. There's a lot of lessons learned from the SEED program for me. Uh, is that, you know, before seed came, I was not really thinking about this whole idea of my son getting money to be saved to go to school. But seed really encourages that and um, motivated me to say, you know, this is so key, this is so important, that even beyond the seed program, we have made sacrifice to make deposit into the 529 plan so that this young man can have an opportunity to go to college and to do what he desired to do. Thank you so much. Can I invite Ray and Lisa and Treasurer Cisneros up to the front? Uh, Joshua and Reverend Flores will be here, um, so at the end if you have more questions for them. But I do want to do the pivot now to policy. Again, it, this was a policy demonstration. It was a policy dream. Uh, we wanted to test it. Um, but we also then wanted to build on what we learned. Um, I am honored, again, to present uh, these three folks to you. Uh, Treasurer Cisneros is a repeat innovator. 
Uh, he started uh, the Bank on San Francisco program, which is now Bank on USA and Bank on name your municipality, name your state. Uh, he then started uh, Payday Plus for reasonable uh, payday loans, uh, Check Free San Francisco, and in the initiative, which he'll talk about today, near to my heart, San Francisco's very innovative kindergarten to college program, which will roll out this fall. Uh, after Treasurer Cisneros speaks, uh, Ray Boschera uh, at the New America Foundation, now a vice president, uh, will speak. I have to tell you that almost, how long ago was it? Uh, 20, 25 years ago. We had a uh, briefing like this at the end of our self-employment investment demonstration, the first seed, to test whether self-employment might be a route out of poverty uh, for uh, folks on welfare. And we had only one person attend that <laughs> briefing. I had 16 speakers, um, one person. But that one person was Ray Boschera. And <laughs> And so uh, you all have your work cut out for you. Um, but uh, ever since, he's been leading the development of asset policy in this country. And really, uh, we were fortunate enough to have him as policy director at CFED for a while. And then he went to New America, uh, where he has shepherded uh, and led uh, child development account policy at the federal level for the last several years, along with his colleagues who are also here. Um, and last but not least, <laughs> Lisa Mensa, who uh, started her career as a banker, uh, went to the Ford Foundation, where I have to say I loved her uh, funding philosophy, which she summarized for me once as find good grantees and shovel out the money. <laughs> um, <laughs> She did very well. And then offered a promotion at Ford or to do what she really believed in. She went to the uh, Aspen uh, Institute, started the initiative for financial security to champion uh, asset building policy, uh, including but not limited in any way to child accounts. Uh, I'm tremendously grateful to these three and the folks they have surrounded themselves with for their leadership. Treasurer Cisneros. Thank you, Bob. Good morning, everyone. I'm very, very happy to be here um, and to be able to talk to you about this exciting new program we're going to be launching in San Francisco. Let me tell you a little bit about the landscape in San Francisco. One out of every three San Francisco children will be born into families with no savings or assets of any kind, none. And when we look at African American and Latino neighborhoods, that incidence goes up to one out of every two. In San Francisco, almost 100% of the parents surveyed said they plan to save for their child's college education, but only 50% are actually doing it. So we wanted to do something about that. You've heard that we're not shy about trying to tackle these issues in San Francisco. So I'm proud to be able to tell you today that this fall, San Francisco will launch the first publicly funded universal matched children's savings account program in the country. We are very, very excited about that. <laughs> We're calling the program Kindergarten to College, and I'm confident this is gonna make a difference for the people that live in our city. But before I go any further, I really want to share a lot of the reasoning and the background and why we got to this place. We really wanna change the landscape. Our goals are to increase the aspirations for every child in our city. We want them to realize that college is a reality for them. We want to help parents learn how they can save. We want to educate them and make sure they have an understanding of how they can do the right thing for their children. We also want to get financial education into our schools. 
We really want there to be a curriculum where this can be taught and discussed. When every child has an account, every teacher has a teaching tool to talk about financial education. And we want to leverage private investment. We want to be able to give everybody a chance to make our families and our kids in San Francisco successful. So how are we going to do this? Well, we're going to listen to all of you. We're going to follow what the research has said. We're going to make our program automatic. People will be enrolled automatically. They will open up accounts. We will open up accounts for them. They don't need to do that. It will be universal. All the children entering the public school will be included. And we will offer an initial seed deposit. So our public money will go into the accounts to start off the savings. But we'll also offer, as we've heard today is so important, matched savings opportunity. So people have an opportunity to be rewarded once they learn how they can save. We want to make sure there's a variety of ways they can put money into the account, so we're going to offer different uh, types of saving options. And as I said, we're going to link all of this to financial education, both financial education for the children, but also, and maybe even most importantly, for, the ch for their parents, for their families, for everybody in the community. So here's how it's going to work. As kids enter the San Francisco public school system, they will automatically receive a college savings account with an initial deposit of $50 from the city. Children who are eligible for free and reduced price lunch will get another $50. We will really work hard, though, to make sure that families understand that the savings comes from them, that they have to participate in their child's success. We're going to reach out, educate them, offer them guidance, but we're also going to offer them real incentives. In the very first year of the program, our partner Earn has allowed us to be able to offer to every family a one-to-one -one dollar match for the first $100 they save in our program. I'm very excited about that. I'm excited that we're going to be able to offer this to all the families that we're reaching out to in the first year. We're doing this in steps. There's about 4,900 kids that enter the public schools every year in San Francisco. In the first year, we're going to cover 25% of them, 18 different elementary schools. In the second year, we'll double that. In the third year, we're going to cover everybody. And that's what we're excited about. Now, I want to make sure you understand <laughs> this is not going to be easy. We worked very hard in very difficult budget times to get this money allocated. And I'm excited to say we were successful at that. But we need your help. We need your help getting the right accounts in place. We need your help putting the right education in place. We need help with letting people know how this program works most effectively. I'm sure we can do this in San Francisco. I'm sure we can get there with your help. But most importantly, I'm sure we can do this for the families. I know the families are ready. When we talk to families in San Francisco, they say, thank you. This is the most exciting thing they've heard about in a long, long time. And they want to know, how can I get this for the rest of my children? Thank you so much for your time today. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, uh, we're all inspired, Treasurer Cisneros, thank you so much. Um, you know, when I started this work 20 years ago, little did I know that Michael's idea, Bob's organization, and Lisa's funding would change my professional life. <laughs> um, but it has, and um, it's great to be here at the end of another demonstration. Um, Bob, we're all eager to see what you're going to organize next to keep us all together in changing policy. Um, it's, it's been a great journey, and I feel honored to be a part of it. I, uh, you know, I think, I think SEED has a lot to be proud of, um, and it, really anybody working on child, child savings accounts really has a lot to be proud of. When we started this demonstration, what was it, 2002, 2003, you know, there were no proposals in Congress. There were no proposals in cities. Uh, the UK Child Trust Fund had not been launched. There was no seed OK. There was no policy in Maine. Um, but since then, we've had five proposals in Congress. 
we've had uh, you know, great proposals, some of them starting at birth in states, uh, city of Caguas, Puerto Rico, and now San Francisco leading the way with these policies that start as early as birth. Uh, and I think we can even take credit for the launching of the Child Trust Fund, but certainly not for its demise. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this field really was an important part of that, that progress as well. So I think, I think we really have a lot to be proud of, and SEED in particular, for inspiring and informing um, and advancing these policies. So I think in, you know, if the purpose was to leverage policy, I think SEED did a, did a fabulous job. And it's thanks to Joshua and the partners and the funders and everybody who made that possible. I just want to talk about three things very briefly. Uh, why CDA policy? Who supports it? And how do we do it? Um, so why? I, you know, there's, Michael summarized a lot of the research really well, um, but I, you know, just to have an even cruder summary, um, I, you know, we've learned from researchers that kids with assets do better than those that don't, and in general, the earlier in life you have assets, the better you're going to do. Also, some other researchers, including um, Dalton Conley at NYU, folks at the Heritage Foundation, some folks at the Boston Fed, Pew, Pew's Economic Mobility Project, have all basically found that it's, that it's net worth and financial capital that drives opportunity for the next generation. You know, if we really want to break this cycle where um, lack of opportunity in one generation becomes, uh, you know, becomes, uh, you know, persists through the generations. We have, to, we have to break that cycle by endowing every generation with a dose of assets. And now we have research to show that it's really net worth and capital that drives opportunity for the next generation. And then the, um, you know, the third reason why CDA policy, as Michael alluded to, I think we're, we're reevaluating the role of savings uh, in the economy. We are deleveraging, uh, which we need to do. This economy has been, the economy's growth has been fueled by debt. It needs to be fueled by savings and a different economic model, which includes savings and investment. So I think we're going to do our small part to usher in the save and invest economy. All right, second, who supports it? Um, you know, it was great to hear Joshua talk about that charter school in Philadelphia. Uh, we were there back in 2004, 2005, I can't remember w when it was. But, um, you know, it was, it was a great moment for us because at that, at that event, we had an event at charter school, Senator Santorum, Rick Santorum, and Senator John Corzine at the time, arch enemies, arch enemies stood together on that stage and said, we support the Aspire Act. We support a savings account at birth for every child in America. It was a great moment. You know, this was back when people were talking about the nuclear option, and these guys got up together and said, we're going to do this. And later they were joined by Senator DeMint and Senator Schumer. Can you believe that? Um, you know, in support of this policy. And it's not just them. It was Bob Carey, it's Patrick Kennedy, it's uh, Michael Gerson, the presidential speechwriter for, uh, uh, for President Bush, David Brooks, Newt Gingrich, uh, Jeff Sessions. Uh, you know, as Michael said, you know, I have never seen a savings policy in the multi-billion dollar level that has brought Democrats and Republicans together as much as this idea. And so I think, I think even though we haven't passed a poli policy yet, we've got a, great, we've got a great foundation. And of course, as I mentioned, there's, states in policy, uh, there's policies in states. Uh, we've got countries, uh, you know, Korea, Canada, Singapore, and even Israel is now getting ready to do a savings account at birth for every child. And then finally, of course, 69% uh, of um, all households and 78% of parents uh, support this policy, as we know from the research of Peter Hart and Associates. Third point, final point, uh, how would we do it? Um, I think, you know, when you move from policy to politics, you have to ask the question, well, what, what problem are you trying to solve? And I think we, we believe, because this is kind of a new paradigm breakthrough policy, that this idea will do something about inequality, about asset poverty, about opportunity, about savings, financial literacy, home ownership, college attendance, and it's true that I think it will do all those things. However, politically, I think we've realized that our best argument, um, at least in this Congress at this time, is that this policy will make enormous progress in building savings, retirement security, and financial literacy. Not to discount the other purposes, but at least in the U.S. Congress, these have turned out to be very compelling reasons. 
And so I think if, that, if that's the stage that we're going to work with, we have a lot to offer. I, I, I really think that these accounts can make progress on all three of those fronts. And we have an opportunity. We have expiring tax cuts. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna fine tune or reform Social Security. Um, we could be um, rethinking the estate tax. We're going to be expanding the savers credit. These are all opportunities to include a savings account at birth in those policies. If the idea is to build retirement security, then it's an even better idea to start it earlier in life. And so my view is that, and we shouldn't worry too, mu too much about whether it's a lifetime savings account or a kid's account. You know, you know, I'm happy to start IRAs at birth. You know, that's fine with me. You know, the point is to start, and to start early and to start right. So I would love to see an IRA at birth, or whatever we call it, as part of Social Security reform, savers credit reform, or even estate tax reform. You know, why not make every baby a trust fund baby is, is how the idea goes. Um, and even 529s are a promising platform and may end up being, you know, the, the means through which we get to scale uh, at some point. So um, start small, that's fine. You know, the research says even an account or even modest savings and even modest amounts of assets can have a huge asset effect over the life course. Um, so, you know, what matters is that we start, we can even start small, and that we start right, but we must start. Thank you. I am standing between you and your questions, so I'm going to move quickly. Press conferences are about breakthroughs and about news. And I hope you're getting the point that our breakthrough is that we have the big policy idea here. And it's in this very small package. And it's with our children. It's with the Joshuas of the world. And the breakthrough here is that we can transform financial security in this country. And we've got to start it with every child, and it starts with something very small. So if you don't walk out of this uh, meeting with anything else, know that the 1,700 kids and their families that were affected by the seed demonstrated, demonstration started with this small nest egg, the $500 launching pad, and they transformed it into what you see in Joshua's life, 4,500. And where's Joshua going when he's 50, for those of us who are near that age? Um, this is transformative politics, and what Michael and Bob and all of us, this is a family affair in many ways. What we've been involved in for 20 years is really pushing this breakthrough to say we must do it differently in this country. So thank you, San Francisco, for showing that this is more than the Ford Foundation and its many partners, that this is really about how we as a country spend our money and how we launch the next generation. You are the first to break through. And it was buried in there, but this is, this is the worst time for city budgets and state budgets. Every other place has been blocked. And San Francisco reached down, found those kids, and there are many poor children in, in, in your very wealthy and beautiful city that we all think of. You reached out and found those kids. And I love the way you've started and put us on the right path. And it is a huge breakthrough undergirded by this research. I have two things I want to say today. I want to say a little something about um, the UK. You've heard us refer to it, uh, about, about breakthroughs. And, and then I want to end on add the kids. The UK uh, beat us to the punch. And they started the Child Trust Fund. And $500 or 250 pounds, as they say there, uh, was uh, automatically uh, vouchered to every child. In, um, in the UK. And this has been a powerful policy that has put, for the first time, um, you know, individual accounts in children's names. They're further ahead than all of us because it's actually in Joshua's name that an account was started. And they've put it on hold. It's not over, but it's on hold. And it's on hold because of budget cuts. And when I talked to our friend David White, who leads the largest uh, seller of these accounts, he said, I wish, he said a lot of things, but I wish they had understood one thing that this wasn't a little thing for kids that could have been just put on hold. I wish they'd seen these accounts for the transformational thing they are. They're not, nowhere in the Western world are we going to be able to grapple with how we move ahead as a country if we don't endow our kids and if we don't start the saving and investing from the beginning. I wish they'd look more like a pension than a child handout. And I think that's our goal here, to try to tell you that what we're saying with the 1,700 kids 
in Seed, with all of the Joshua stories, is that this is the transformative uh, breakthrough. The other thing he said is, I wish more people understood it. We do not have a political uh, culture that understands it. So the, there's, there's embers there. Why did Sampor Santorum and Corzine uh, like this, the same thing. It, it does speak uh, deeper than partisan, but we don't have leaders that understand it. And that's where I want to talk about add the kids. We do understand fear. We understand the front page of the Washington Post yesterday, fragile nest eggs. One reason, it's not just that the nest eggs are fragile, they're too small. They're way too small. We're holding far too little money. And that people understand. But the only way we're going to get a bigger nest egg is to start early. And that's part of why we're excited about this. Those kindergarten kids and the kids in Oklahoma, um, they will have a different life. Joshua, you will have a different life. And you know, the $4,500 may get you through two years, or we don't know, but your life is going to be different because of that. You will have held wealth, and you will be different than most kids in America. And that is why we must add the kids to our saving system. We have a saving system that many people up the hill are discussing today and there's a retirement debate a tax debate it's it's filled with billions of dollars of subsidy adding the children to it would take two billion uh, to give everyone five hundred dollars it is not a stretch and we have to stop thinking of it as uh, crumbs from the table this is what we do we decide what to do with our tax policy so we are at a new moment uh, the last century gave us social security this century needs to give us additions to that very b important base. And child accounts are part of that. We don't see it that way yet. Uh, you're part of us now, this uh, group in this room, who understand what 1,700 lives were changed. Um, it is a small down payment on a very big change, and it's why we're all excited about it. Uh, please ask us your questions. We need more people who understand this policy and more people who can help sell it. So thank you. Thank you, Jose, Ray, and Lisa. Um, you never disappoint. Uh, can I ask Michael and Joshua to join us up here? Uh, and we'll take your questions, but I think I want to first um, ask <clears throat> Reed Kramer, who took over from Ray's capable hands <clears throat> to lead uh, the asset building program at New America. Uh, I first met uh, Reed when he was at the Office of Management and Budget uh, looking over the proposed Assets uh, for Independence Act. Um, and I think I want to ask him to put his OMB hat on. Uh, he can answer all the hardest questions that <laughs> if, uh, if any of these folks can't. Um, but I, I guess I'd ask you, can we afford this and what did we miss? <laughs> can't afford it, uh, but it, budgets are a matter of priorities, and it's interesting to see how San Francisco has uh, approached their priorities in thinking about this work. And so I actually have some hard questions I wanted to throw to Jose. Uh, you know, this idea has um, triggered a lot of uh, federal policy proposals. One of them that Ray mentioned is the Aspire Act that has this bipartisan support. It's been introduced in, in both houses of Congress, uh, but the details in the act are quite interesting because it creates a special product um, along with other protections that go along with that product. It gets special tax treatment. Um, it uh, is designed to be lifelong. It rolls over into other accounts uh, like the Roth IRA. It's a special product. Now, at the local level, you didn't really have, you were, uh, couldn't, couldn't leverage some of that because it was created by federal policy, but I know you're interested in issues of encouraging deposits, and automatic enrollment and some of those consumer protections. And I just wanted to kind of have you address how you really approach some of those uh, topics when uh, you couldn't really create a new product the same way that some of these other proposals can. Right. Thank you, Reed. Um, <clears throat> you're exactly right. We're a city. We cannot make laws that affect all banks in our city or in the country. <clears throat> we cannot create new products. We cannot change taxes. Uh, tax laws uh, from the federal government. So we had to live within those confines, and it's really a work in progress. 
We've been looking at the 529 products. We're excited about the opportunities there. That is an account that's set up for college savings with appropriate tax um, benefits and accommodations. Um, we're looking at that, but and we're also looking at more standard savings accounts. What we're really um, challenged by, though, is the fact that we need our program to be automatic. We need to open up these accounts automatically for every child when they enter the public school system. And many of the existing accounts require um, parent signatures, parent consent, uh, social security numbers for a parent or a child or both or either. Um, and we need to move beyond that because we need to make sure that we can open an account for absolutely every child. So we're right now in the process of working on that with um, a handful of financial institutions. We're close. We hope we're going to have an announcement soon where we're going to announce that we will be able to do that. But I'm very much looking forward to working with all of you and working with um, your folks that are engaged with the federal government to see what these new accounts and these new opportunities might look like. Hopefully, we can participate with you in that because as we roll this out to literally thousands of new account holders every year, we're going to learn things. We're going to learn about what, what, what motivates them and what, what they react to. One of the things we have a gut feeling about is that we think that we want to make it very, very easy for these families to save. Very, very, very easy. And if that means they might want to stop into a bank branch on their way to work or on their way home from work or, on their, or even one of their kids on their way to school, why not give them that opportunity? Maybe if they could have a, 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 a some sort of an ATM card where they could take money they just earned, drop it into an ATM, and it would now be in their college savings account. How nice would that be? But in addition, of course, all the automatic savings, all the ACH opportunities, all the online solutions. We want to have it all. Where can we get that? I'm not, fine. I'm not sure we're there yet. I know we're not there yet, but I'm hopeful we're going to get there. I don't know if I missed it, but there's so much innovation going on in, in San Francisco. I think the other piece to note is now financial education as part of kindergarten to college is going to be rolled into the public school system every grade. Uh, it's an extraordinary partnership. Questions? Excellent question. Um, when we reached out to the public schools in San Francisco with this idea, we weren't sure what kind of reaction we were going to get. We thought, well, you know, public schools, they're under the same budget problems that the city is, even worse sometimes. So do they really want to get engaged in another program, another new idea? It's going to take resources. I have to tell you, they could not have been more excited. From the administration all the way on down, they saw these accounts as providing real opportunity, real benefits, and a real investment in each and every one of their students. We then went beyond the administration, and we met with principals and teachers. And we said, if we have these accounts, and you know every child in your classroom has one, would you use that as a teaching tool? Would you add financial education to your classroom curriculum? And again, we were prepared to, oh my gosh, you know, get out of here. I've got enough to teach. I've got the test to teach you, teach to you know, get out of here. And so we were so surprised because they were extremely enthusiastic. They said, absolutely, I can work this into my math curriculum. I can work it into other places in the curriculum. Knowing that every child has one of these accounts frees us to be able to talk about this and use it as a tool. So they're very, very excited. We're getting um, curriculums from a number of other places that we're introducing to the school system. Uh, we're researching which ones they want to select, and we're going to be bringing them in at all different grade levels, even at the kindergarten level, which I was a little bit surprised at, honestly. But I actually had a parent tell me, you know, my kindergartner knows a lot about how to spend money. <laughs> I'm confident my kindergartner can learn how to save money. So we're going to start there. Great. And can I ask you all to wait for the microphone? We are recording this so that it will be available, but if you don't use a microphone, we won't get your voice. Thank you for a great presentation. Joshua is a fellow Philadelphian. Congratulations to you, my brother. <laughs> Way to go. 
my, my question is, given all this momentum that this study is finding, is there any kind of national coalition or group to help move this forward and maybe rejuvenate the political momentum in the new Congress or bring other groups on board? Uh, yes, there is. There's the <coughs> Alliance for College Savings, um, which uh, we have kind of all of these organizations and a lot more uh, who have signed up for. But again, we need, we need more. Um, and we want to make this a real concentration uh, over the next several years. How do we find out about this? Uh, we can, where is Carol? Oh, there, <laughs> right behind you. Great Carol, question, Don. Please. Thank you. It's the Child There's Savings a Account Coalition, Child Savings Account Coalition. We've got 65 groups on, as coalition members, any uh, financial institutions, uh, nonprofits, corporations, some of the groups are local, some are state, uh, about half are national, and you can sign up at CFED.org. Carol Wayman is our policy director <clears throat> in the back. And could you identify yourself as well? Uh, yeah, I'm David Stace. Uh, question uh, about the revolution that's occurring with regard to financial services. We have evolving uh, uh, devices such as reloadable debit cards, and I'm, and I'm curious with respect to this question of uh, automatic deposits, if anybody has moved in the direction of uh, creating through reloadable debit cards an automatic diversion to savings accounts. Do you want me to comment a little uh, bit? Uh, this is our resident expert on financial uh, institutions. You're um, speaking to the kind of revolution at one end of the savings and spending side, which is the FDIC insured side of where do we keep our short term money. And with child accounts, we kind of have the picture of both things, both how do we use our money short term and what's the long term? So that when we speak about 529s or IRAs, we're not usually talking about debit accounts. Those aren't easily linked accounts. And when we talk about day-to-day -day savings, we're talking exactly as you are in the conference that many of us are going to be joining CFED at this week has whole tracks around sort of the revolution and how the spending and saving cards. and from B of A doing their Keep the Change to various credit union products which are m marrying the ease of access to your money. I mean, I do feel that we're moving to a card world and uh, all those cards take underlying accounts. Uh, Treasury has just announced a new pilot they'll be doing soon to do a, a tax time account card that can be loaded with your tax refund and um, essentially a checklist checking account. What's interesting to us about the child account link is we need something that's, as, this, uh, as Treasurer Sisnow says, easy to load, easy to add to, but also safe and ability to grow and where you can't touch it. So we need both things. We need it to be easy to add to, but hard to get at, and very, very sticky, and hopefully invested. Um, what you talked about, the rollout of Joshua's account, also got it into a place where it can, can actually have more growth, more, um, you know, most people know we're earning under you know, uh, 50 basis points for savings accounts nowadays. So it would be greater to it would be great to have more. So I wouldn't say that the child account field has figured out how to join the card world, but that those uh, those worlds are coming together. And what I think is challenging is to put the uh, IRA side investment money with the day-to-day -day money that, that is usually part of a debit. And we we actually need both. We need a way to get it at our short-term money, and we need a way to save it in a sticky, sound, safe, and hopefully robust uh, or an interest-bearing way. And I just want to add, there is increasing interest and activity in our largest financial institutions, Citigroup, B of A, uh, Wells, other banking uh, and uh, financial institutions really are working on this, uh, beginning to see uh, the potential here. And they will be crucial partners in this. Um, I should have mentioned another of our charter members of the coalition, which I called by the wrong name, um, is Carl Reed at the UNCF, um, launching with us a major initiative 
on college savings. Other questions? Jennifer Gager Holland, The Finance Project. Treasurer Cisneros, you talked about, um, you alluded to some of the things that you expect to learn from the Kindergarten to College initiative and was just hoping to hear more of what either the City of San Francisco or third parties are doing to research and look at the results of the initiative as it rolls out. Sure, sure. We absolutely are, are I want to make sure this program is, is being productive and uh, getting results. Now, obviously, you know, putting a, an account in place for a child in kindergarten and waiting to see how likely they were to go to college is a bit of a long wait to find out uh, how your program did. So we're going to be looking at a lot of different things. We actually already are working in partnership with Stanford University to construct um, um, an evaluation um, program for the project that we're launching on. And one of the things, many of the things we're looking at are what kind of behaviors do we see occurring once these accounts are in place? How do the children uh, look at themselves and their situation the same, differently? And perhaps more importantly, how can we reach um, parents and families? I mentioned the dollar for dollar uh, match for the first $100 that the families are putting into the program. But we also have already received funding to provide some other incentives to change behavior. For example, we have some money that we're going to be offering for good attendance. Attendance is an issue at all grade levels, and we wanted to make sure that, that there was an opportunity for kids and their families to be able to, again, earn actual additional savings by having good attendance. There all, we also wanted to look at maybe opportunities for family members, for parents, to be able to go participate and take financial education classes and receive an incentive payment into their child's college savings accounts upon completion of that training. So we, by putting all these different opportunities out there, what we're really going to be looking at is how does that affect behavior, how does that change the situation for the children and for their families. I think we'll take one more question uh, right up here, up, up in front. <laughs> Morning, Emilio Adolfo Rivero. Um, first of all, compliments to the panel. You have raised a very, very important question and appeals to the intelligence on young people. We also know that in the last two or three years, millions of Americans have lost their, the savings of their lives, their homes. So we have gone through that experience. And I would, in a brief words, I would like to give an insurance against that. When you ask in the future to one of these gentlemen or ladies who have saved, if you ask them what you're worth, they will answer in figures. And perhaps it would be advisable to, that you suggest to them that when you ask them what's your worth, they answer, I have studied this, I have achieved this. Because instead of judging a person for what they have, we must judge them for what they are. And this without excluding what you are recommending, which is very intelligent. But the second part I mentioned, that you are what you have done, that appeals to their wisdom. You have appealed to their intelligence, let's appeal to their wisdom. There is nothing to consider if you have a million dollars or two million dollars and you are nothing. The important thing is not what you have, but who you are. Thank you. That's a great yeah. last. Thank you so much. I, I think that's a great last word um, for us. And I think we do agree that the function of child savings accounts is to unlock the potential and the future that we believe is in all of our kids and, and all of our federal, uh, fellow citizens. I want to bring this to a close. I think folks will be around uh, for a little longer. I do want to thank the people that made today possible, our partners at New America Foundation, Reed and Justin and Rachel, 
Olivia and others. Um, uh, the the uh, Hatcher Group, um, Rob Dougherty, uh, and the Annie Casey Foundation, who supplied them to us, uh, all of our partners, my colleagues at uh, CFED, my boss, Andrea LeVere, who allows me to play uh, on things like this, uh, our communications director, Kay Higgins. But most of all, thank you uh, to all of you. Uh, for coming this morning and hopefully taking us forward as Ray did <laughs> 20 years ago. Thank you.